If you're listening to this episode as it comes out, you will know that we are still currently in the midst of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. War is, as has been well documented, as close to hell on earth as one can get. Yet, out of these terrible conflicts, there are always glimmers of humanity that shine through in even the darkest of moments. In times of difficulty, turmoil and loss, we look for goodness, hope and joy. And sometimes we find them in ways we never expect in a friendly word, or even in a small act of kindness. And so, while war rages, today we get to look back on the story of a man who used what little he had to be a light in the darkness and brighten up the days of grateful children caught in a conflict not of their own making. This is the story of Gail Helverson, who was known to the children of Berlin as the Schokoladenflieger, or the Chocolate Flyer, otherwise known as Uncle Wiggly Wings, or the most widely known of all, the Candy Bomber of Berlin. Welcome to the fantastic history of food. Strange but true stories from history that in some way involve food. I'm your host, Nick Charlie Key. Gail Seymour Halverson was born in Salt Lake City on October 10, 1920, to Basil and Luella Halverson. He grew up on small farms, first in Idaho and then in Utah. He attended Utah State University and while there, earned his private pilot's license under the non-college civilian pilot training program in September of 1941. Once he had his license, he soon joined the Civil Air Patrol as a pilot. Only a few months later, Halverson decided to join the United States Army Air Forces in May of 1942 and was just 22 years old when he arrived in Oklahoma to begin his training. He was assigned to a squadron to train with 25 aviation cadets and 77 Royal Air Force cadets at the number 3 British Flying Training School. After completing his pilot's training, he returned to the Army Air Forces and was assigned flight duties in foreign transport operations in the South Atlantic. Once the Second World War was over and the Cold War had begun to set in, he was ordered to report to Germany on July 10th of 1948 to be a pilot in what is now known as the Berlin Airlift. At the end of the war, Germany had been divided into four separate and distinct zones of occupation. Each of America, Britain, France and Soviet Russia laid claim to a quarter of the country. In yet more unnecessary confusion, the bombed-out capital of Berlin, which fell entirely within the Soviet-controlled section, was itself further divided by the four nations, with the Soviets claiming control of the entire eastern half of the city. As the Cold War began and the other three nations combined their territories into one single functioning economic zone, the Soviets began to fear that Western forces would try a takeover of their East Berlin territory. So in 1948, they began blockading and eliminating all access routes via rail, road and canal into the Allied-controlled western half of the city. A potentially unintended consequence of this action, or if intended makes it crueler than necessary, was that the population in that western half of the city now had no means by which to bring in medicine, fuel, coal for heat and electricity, or even fresh food. 2.5 million people slowly began to run out of these essential items and their prospects for the future were looking grimmer with each passing day. But all was not lost for them, as there was one route into Berlin which had not yet been closed off, and that was the sky above them. In fact, back in 1945, as the war ended and the country was being divided up, no plans had been made with regards to safe passage along ground routes from the Allied-occupied territory in West Germany to their enclaves in West Berlin. This was not the case, however, when it came to agreements with regards to aerial routes. It was on the 30th of November 1945 that they had agreed that there would be three 20-mile-wide air corridors through which the other three nations could freely access their territories in Berlin. This was agreed ostensibly to fly in any sort of aid packages to their territories, and unlike tanks, trucks and other armaments, the Soviets couldn't claim to feel threatened by simple cargo aircraft ferrying goods back and forth. It was because of this pre-agreed concession that the idea of the Berlin airlift was first brought to the table. The Allied forces couldn't sit back and watch their troops and the people in their territories starve or freeze to death, and so swiftly began planning a way to get supplies into the territory.
The British had themselves even begun a smaller, more targeted airlift of their own to support just the British troops in Berlin. And so, when the American forces came calling with a request to work together in a joint airlift operation, the British could bring concrete numbers to the table when it came to the amount of resources that would be required to support the entire city. It was calculated that for each adult they would need to provide a daily ration of just under 2,000 calories worth of food. And when that number was times by the population in the city, it came out to a staggering figure. Each day, they would need to fly in 646 tons of flour and wheat, 125 tons of cereal, 64 tons of fat, 109 tons of meat and fish, 180 tons of potatoes, 180 tons of sugar, 11 tons of coffee, 19 tons of powdered milk, 5 tons of fresh whole milk for consumption by the young children, 3 tons of yeast for baking, 144 tons of dehydrated vegetables, 38 tons of salt, and 10 tons of cheese. That is a frankly ridiculous amount of food. And bear in mind, that only lasted for one day. All in all, when calculated all together, that amounts to over 1,500 tons of supplies each and every day to sustain the over 2 million people. And yet, even this paled in comparison to the 3,500 tons of coal, diesel and petrol required for daily heating, electricity and fuel. Initially, one might think the problem would be sourcing all of those goods. But in fact, the bigger logistical issue was how to transport roughly 5,000 tons a day when at that point they only had enough aircraft to transport around 700 tons a day if all went smoothly. The United States, Britain and Australia joined forces to make this airlift supply to Berlin a reality. It took some time to put all of the logistical plans in place, but soon hundreds of planes were being flown in to aid the effort at hand. As day one of the airlift began and the myriad of moving parts all began to align themselves, they were only able to send just 90 tons of supplies. By week two, however, they were up to 1,000 tons a day and becoming more and more efficient with each round trip. More than 1,000 aircrafts were involved in the supply chain back and forth, and so some very efficient planning was needed in order to make sure they could all fly safely there and back again without crashing into one another. They came up with an amazing strategy. Due to there being three corridors within which they could safely fly, they would all set out northeast through the American corridor, landing at Tempelhof Airport. Then, having offloaded their cargoes, they would return due west via the British Air Corridor. Once they safely reached British airspace, they would return to their respective bases for restocking. Many aircraft didn't even waste time with landing and would simply parachute their coal supplies directly onto the airfields and return home again. Some specialized water planes were even brought in that could land on the Havel River, and due to their corrosion-resistant hulls, they were the perfect vessels to deliver the baking powder and salt into the city. The next problem they faced was that they had aircraft taking off every four minutes, and due to the narrow airspace, they began having to essentially stack the aircraft in the sky so as to ensure their safety. Each plane that took off would fly 1,000 feet higher than the plane in front of it, beginning at 5,000 feet and then repeating five times before starting again from the bottom. This system would later come to be known as the ladder. Gail Halverson reported for duty in July 1948. He had remained in military service even after the war, as he had hoped at some point to see combat. Even though he had served in World War II, he was assigned the task of ferrying bombers and transport planes across the South Atlantic Ocean for the European and North African campaigns, all of which turned out to be combat-free missions. When the war was over, he was sent to a base in Alabama, and when the military began looking for willing and able pilots to support the Berlin airlift mission, Helverson was eager and willing to help. He began his supply runs with the other pilots and was drawn in by the beauty of a country dragging itself out of a devastating war. He was so enamored by Berlin itself, in fact, that even on his own personal off time, he chose to tag along on a flight into Berlin so that he could make short mini-movies with his personal handheld camera. It was this act, in particular, that would change the course of his life and the sentiment behind the airlift in general forever. 
It was on the 17th of July 1948, just a month into his new role, that he touched down at Tempelhof Airfield, and seeing a crowd of children gathered at the end of the runway, walked over to them to see what they were up to. When he reached them, he introduced himself in his best broken German, and they began asking him all sorts of questions about the aircraft and their flights in and out of the city. He spoke to them for a while as best he could, and then, just before heading back to the plane, he felt around in his pocket for something to give the children as a parting gift. All he had was two sticks of Wrigley's double mint chewing gum. The children's eyes widened, and the boy who received the gum from him quickly set about dividing it up equally amongst all of the children who were present, even passing the gum wrapper around for other children to smell. None of the children fought over the gum and were overjoyed to taste even the tiniest of slivers. Helverson was so impressed by their manners and gratitude that he promised the children that the next time he flew over the city, he would drop off some more sweets for them. As he was leaving, one of the children said, There are so many aeroplanes flying overhead each day, how will we know which one of them is you? He simply replied, Don't worry, I'll wiggle my wings. Morning dawned the following day, and Lieutenant Helverson remembered his promise to the children at the airfield. He told his co-pilot and engineer of his plan, and together the three men pulled their candy rations for the upcoming drop. Helverson began packaging up the candy stash into three separate packages, and realizing that the bundles were quite solid and heavy, made three little parachutes out of handkerchiefs which he then attached to each bundle, to make sure that the falling candy didn't hurt any of the children. They loaded up the plane with the cargo for the drop, and Helverson made sure to keep the three little packages with him on his lap. Once everything was ready and they were given the green light to take off, Helverson lifted his craft into the sky and turned towards Berlin. After a while, he could see the city in front of him and began his approach towards Tempelhof Airfield. As he drew closer, he began to notice a small crowd of children gathered just outside the airfield gates. They had been waiting for him to arrive. He put his hands on the controls and as he neared them, he shifted it left and then right wiggling the aircraft's wings to signal his arrival to the children. He slid open his window and he dropped the packages to the jubilant children eagerly waiting below. Naturally, word got around the base of what he and his team were doing and soon pilots, engineers and other air servicemen were donating their candy rations to Halverson to drop on his missions into the city. Each and every day that Halverson flew into the city, the number of children waiting below grew and grew. Eventually, it got to the point where Halverson had too many sweets to carry in one trip, and so he began enlisting the help of other pilots to drop the candy as well. They all agreed, and all would go through the same ritual of wiggling their wings and dropping the parachute packages out of the window to the children below. Before long, the airbase became inundated with letters from children with special requests for certain types of candy, and even more, just wanting to say thank you to the pilots for the treats they dropped each day. An especially amusing letter arrived one day from a nine-year-old boy named Peter Zimmerman. In the letter, he had included a homemade parachute and a map to his own house so that Uncle Wiggly Wings could make a special delivery directly to him. Helmerson was so intrigued by the letter, and so on his next flight tried his best to follow the directions given to him by young Peter, unfortunately to no avail. It wasn't three days later that another letter arrived from young Peter Zimmerman, which simply read, No chocolate yet. I thought you were a pilot. I even gave you a map. How did you guys win the war anyway? Helverson, instead of being offended by this letter, took it in good spirits, and to make sure that the audacious Peter Zimmerman received his share, mailed a chocolate to his home address. As word of Helverson's candy bombs spread, his superior officers realized the potential for some good PR from all of it, and in January of 1949, they flew Helverson home to do somewhat of a press tour. The news had spread across the United States, and supporters across the country were eager to help in any way they could. Two notable interactions he had while back home was meeting a housebound woman named Dorothy Groger, who, inspired by his actions, had enlisted the help of her network of friends to sew thousands of tiny parachutes for the candy bombers to attach to the packages. In an even more impressive display was the work of a group of schoolchildren from Massachusetts who, through their efforts, were able to prepare over 18 tons of candy, chocolates and chewing gum from all across the country, 
and then had it shipped to the airbase in Germany. As word spread further, major candy companies like Hershey's began to get involved and donated as much as they could towards the effort. In the end, the Berlin airlift was in effect for just under a year, ending in mid-May of 1949. In his six months of flying, Lieutenant Halverson personally flew 126 missions into Berlin. Along with more than 20 other pilots and crew, it is estimated that they dropped more than 250,000 packages for the children of Berlin. In total, for the airlift as a whole, Allied pilots flew more than 278,000 flights into Berlin and carried with them 2.3 million tons of food, coal, medicine and other essential supplies. The children of Berlin never forgot about Uncle Wiggily Wings. In 2004, a woman named Ursula Younger spoke about being a child in those days. She said, Gail Helverson enchanted the children of Berlin. In truth, it wasn't even about the candy. It was merely his profound gesture, showing us that somebody cared. Just a year before she gave this interview, she had managed to meet Gail Helverson in person for the very first time. She recalls how nervous she was, but when he walked into the room, he hugged her and handed her a Hershey's chocolate bar. A woman named Christelle Jonger Voss, who had been 11 when she had stood at the airfield fence, wrote about how the daily ritual had become a symbol of hope and fun at a time in which both were scarce. Many years later, the mayor of Berlin would go on to say, Halverson's deeply human act has never been forgotten. And even Halverson himself sums it all up rather nicely when he said the following. The only way to true fulfillment in life, real fulfillment, is to serve others. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Fantastic History of Food. If you'd like to get in touch, you can find us on Twitter at Food History Pod. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate you taking a moment to rate the show on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen on. And if you can, leave a review as well. I also have a Patreon account where you can support the show and get access to exclusive content, bonus episodes, and even the chance to choose the topic for an upcoming episode. But all of this is only for our Patreon subscribers. Everyone who donates or subscribes will also get a personal shout-out from me on an upcoming episode. Check out our website, where you can find transcripts, show notes, and references for each and every episode at foodhistorypodcast.com. 